Good afternoon, commissioners, staff, and members of the public who are here today. Um, as the chairperson mentioned earlier, National Grid is here today to present to the PUC the company's July 18, 2017 filing. That filing provides the final results of the recent standard offer procurement for the commercial, industrial, and residential groups, as well as the proposed retail rates for standard offer service for the residential and commercial groups for the period of October 2017 through March 2018, and for the industrial group for the month for the months of October 2017 through December 2017. First, I would like to take a moment to thank all of the members of the public who are here today who offered public comment in this proceeding. I do want to stress that National Grid does take the concerns of its customers regarding increases in its energy bills very seriously. I'd like to just give a little bit of background on the company's standard offer service procurement plan. Rhode Island General Law Section 39-1-27.8 requires the company to arrange for a power supply plan for customers who are not otherwise receiving electric service from non-regulated power producers. The plan is then subject to the review and approval of the PUC under Rhode Island law. The company also engages with the Division of Public Utilities and Carriers each year on its procurement plan. The company's filing that's being presented today is pursuant to an approved standard offer procurement plan for 2017. It's important to note that the proposed rates reflect the company's cost to acquire electricity from wholesale electric electricity suppliers on behalf of its customers who have not otherwise chosen to obtain their energy supply from other so sources. The rates that are charged by the company are established in a manner that is consistent with the company's statutory role as the provider of last resort service in Rhode Island, a role required by law since the introduction of retail electricity competition in the state. Rhode Island General Laws 39-1-27.3, which was enacted to promote the development of retail choice for electricity, explicitly states that the rates shall be designed to recover the electric distribution company's cost in no more than the electric distribution company's cost. As you will hear from our witness panel today, these costs are passed on to customers without markup in accordance with Rhode Island law. National Grid's role is to procure electricity for its customers in a manner that's consistent with the development of a retail competitive market for electricity. The proposed rates reflect the wholesale cost of today's marketplace, which affects the entire region, not only Rhode Island. Our witness panel will further discuss these market dynamics. There's also been a significant amount of attention given today to the magnitude of the increase in the proposed rates in this proceeding. National Grid does not take that lightly and shares its con customers' concerns regarding increases in energy costs. Our witness panel will explain the context of this increase in more detail. As noted in the division's memorandum, they found the proposed rates to be in compliance with the company's approved procurement plan. Accordingly, the company urges the PUC to approve the proposed rate as presented in this filing. I'd like to now introduce our panel of witnesses um, and ask that they come. And as we've done in as our customary practice, our intent was to have our witnesses come up to the panel um, in the usual course. I think that's fine. Part of the parties. All in favor of that. The uh, Lieutenant Governor is in favor of a panel. However, um, would uh, we have the opportunity to present openings as well at this time? Uh, do you want to wait until it's time for you to present your case? It's at your discretion, Chair. Whatever you prefer. Yeah, I think we'll do that. introduce our panel and then um, we'll have the uh, an order for swear them in. Um, so we have a panel of three witnesses today. Um, we have Mr. Stephen McCauley, uh, the Director of Wholesale Electric Supply for National Grid. Um, Mr. McCauley and his team conduct the required RFPs to procure power supply to customers. Um, and the results of those RFPs, which are confidential, are then supplied to the PUC after they've been obtained. Uh, we also have Mr. Adam Crary, who's a Senior Analyst in New England Electric Pricing. He's available to answer questions regarding the calculation of the final rate that's been proposed for the three customer groups. 
And last, we have Ms. Laura Rodorma, who's a lead analyst with the company's energy efficiency program in Rhode Island, and who's available to answer questions regarding the company's energy efficiency offerings. Um, and I already introduced earlier um, at the council table with me is Mr. Scott McCabe and Mr. James Rubenonger, also from National Grid. And I do have some, um, a little bit of expanded uh, direct examination prepared for these witnesses, but I don't think it'll take too long. I'm going to start with uh, Mr. McCauley. Good afternoon, Mr. McCauley. Can you just state again your full name for the record? Uh, good afternoon, Stephen McCauley. And could you state your job title and scope of your duties with National Grid? Uh, yes, I'm the Director of Wholesale Electric Supply at U.S. Commodity Trade. Uh, my, respons my responsibilities uh, are to oversee uh, the procurement of the standard office service for any customers that do not elect to uh, take service uh, from a competitive supplier. Uh, and I do that for all national grid operating companies, including the Narragansett Electric Company. Uh, as part of that is uh, overseeing the uh, RFPs for FRS services, uh, which is the full requirement service contracts that we do to secure um, energy capacity and density services. Uh, I assume this role uh, on April 1st, 2017 for my predecessor, Morgan Jensen. Thank you. And have you previously testified before this uh, PUC and other proceedings? Uh, yes, I have uh, in the, uh, the company's uh, GCR filing, gas cost recovery filings uh, for American State Energy Company. Thank you. Um, and since taking on your new role, have you familiarized yourself with the company's current standard offer procurement plan? <laughs> yes, I have. And Mr. McCauley, were the transactions included in the standard offer service rate filing on July 18, 2017, made under your supervision and direction or under that of your predecessor in accordance with the procurement plan? Yes, they were. And could you um, provide the, uh, could you provide an overview of the company's standard offer procurement plan? Uh, yes, uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, the company files the, the plan in March for PUC approval. Um, that details the wholesale uh, procurement, the transactions that we do under the standard offer service for, for the retail rates. Um, we developed this for three different customer groups, the residential, commercial, and industrial groups. Uh, for the residential and the commercial groups, uh, we do two six-month periods. One is the uh, October through March period, that's referred to as the winter period, and then the April through September period, uh, or the summer. And what we do is we procure uh, through our, our RFPs over 21 um, months for the winter period and about 15 months uh, for the summer period. And that equates to about 90% uh, of the electric uh, load for, for our customers. Um, and we're doing this over uh, six month terms, 12 month terms, 18 month terms, and 21, uh, 24 month terms. And we do this to uh, provide the ability to buy, uh, to secure prices over a longer period of, of time um, and so that we can help uh, mitigate volatility and get a, uh, get a dollar cost averaging of pricing over, over that period. Uh, the last 10% we um, secure in the spot market. And as I said, these, are, these plans are approved by, uh, by the PUC. For the industrial customers, we're only doing three month periods, so they're done on a quarterly basis and we're locking up 100% of the, the price for them during the three-month period prior to the, uh, to the return. Um, and were the transactions that are set for uh, were the transactions that are set forth in the procurement summary um, that was filed in this proceeding, were those executed in accordance with the approved uh, procurement plan that you described? Yes, they were. Why is it then that the competitive suppliers are able to offer a lower rate than National Grid's proposed rate in this proceeding? Um, as I said, National Grid offers uh, a rate for a very specific six-month period of time, either the summer period or the winter period. The competitive suppliers can really start that at any, at, at any time for any number of months. So they can do anything from one month to, to, to multiple years. Uh, they also can offer either a fixed price, a variable price, or some combination of that, or even um, 
um, a, a more customized price for a customer so they can, they can go to each one of the customers and really get a different uh, price. Um, so for example, um, the current offerings that you might see out on, uh, that are offered today might include a six month period, but it might be for a six month period starting today and going for the next six months. And if you look at that today, that would include some of the lower cost prices that are in that summer rate. And when you blend it with only four months of the winter rate, you would, uh, it, would, it would appear that there would be a lower six month uh, rate because they're, they're using different month prices. Um, I want to point out that both uh, National Grid and the competitive suppliers have access to the, to the same market. So we're out, um, we're, we're, we're out there buying with, with the competitive suppliers from the same market, so they're not at a, with a different market. Uh, and when, when, you, when you look at National Grid rates, uh, they are comparable with, uh, with the prices that are offered uh, for, for, for a large part of the competitive suppliers. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to just turn your attention now to uh, some of the, the market trends that are affecting the, the proposed rates um, in this docket. Uh, can you explain what National Grid's involvement is in the setting of uh, wholesale electric prices? Uh, sure. Uh, National Grid um, does not have any direct involvement in setting the prices itself. We don't own any, gen any generation. Um, the generator itself is required um, to uh, set its sale price based on its cost to produce energy. And um, then what they have to do is they have to make themselves available to the market or to the ISO, the independent system operator in New England. They have to make that price available. It is then the ISO's responsibility to then look at what their load is on an hourly or five minute basis uh, and select the lowest cost generation to provide uh, electricity to, to the customers in, in the whole region. Um, and so National Grid is not necessarily taking the price risk of the real time or hourly, it is the wholesale marketers that participate in our FR, FRS uh, solicitations, they're the ones that are taking uh, that price risk associated with that. Um, National Grid, when we do our RFPs, we're out selecting the best price from those wholesale suppliers. Okay, thank you. And just for the record, um, could you just clarify uh, what you mean by FRS? Sorry about that. Uh, the full requirement service contracts, and those are contracts that we do with the wholesale suppliers, and as I said, those do include a bundled package of both energy capacity, and I'll, and I'll get into capacity uh, in a little bit, um, and then solar services. Thank you. Um, and does the National Grid earn any profit on the purchase of this electricity? Uh, no, it doesn't. It uh, passes its cost uh, to, from all sales to the customers. Thank you. Um, can you describe the market trends that are driving the rate increase in this proceeding? Uh, a, a, cu a couple of things. One, as I said, uh, National Grid uh, sets its rates two times a year, the October through March period and the April through September period, and there is a um, natural price difference between those two periods, between the summer and the, and the winter time. So you'll get a natural increase in prices when you go from one rate period in the summer to another rate period in, in, in the winter time. Uh, the other reason is we are coming off of um, lower prices over the last couple of years, these are the lowest prices that our customers have seen for a while. So um, any increase in price when it's represented as a percentage will be, will be amplified because it's coming from a lower base price. Um, but most, um, most, in, uh, most importantly, but the, the greatest impact has been to, to the capacity component of the FRS contracts that I, that I discussed, the full requirement service contracts. Uh, prior to um, June of 2017, the capacity component of the price of energy was very stable uh, for, for about seven years. And it was only beginning in June of 2017 when we start to see this increase uh, in the capacity component of the energy cost, of the supply cost. Okay, thank you. And um, speaking of the capacity component, can you provide a brief overview of the forward capacity market and how that impacts electricity prices? Um, sure. The full requirement contracts that, that I talked about has those has those three three components. Um, and most of that capacity cost itself um, comes from the uh, forward capacity auction, or FCA is what it's referred to. Um, and it's the ISO, as I said, it's, there, it's the ISO's responsibility 
to look on a forward basis and make sure that there are adequate resources to meet any future uh, load it itself. So the ISO runs um, these auctions three years in advance um, to make sure that there are adequate resources. Um, and it was in the FCA or the or capacity auction number eight that we started to see this, uh, this, this increase. Um, and what the ISO does is it aggregates all of these costs and it puts it into uh, the, the cost to the customers who, who are the load serving entities. And it's, real, it is based on not on how much, how much they use, but when they use it itself. Thank you. Um, and can you explain why the prices that were bid in the 2014 auction were much higher than in prior years? Um, sure. We, we did indicate in uh, PC 1-1 um, you know, the uh, prices in the forward, forward capacity uh, auction. Um, and prior to 2014, when, when the auction did occur, uh, there were adequate resources uh, to, meet, to meet the demand. And right before the uh, FCA or forward capacity auction number eight, uh, there was announcements of, of 30, about 3,200 megawatts of, of generation that was going to retire. And it was because of the loss of this generation um, that the auction prices uh, went up significantly. Uh, and this was this was due to again just the now the insufficient uh, generation resources that would be available. Okay, thank you. Um, so, given all of this, what does the company recommend to customers uh, to mitigate the impacts of, of these rising energy costs? Um, you, the three things that, that uh, our customers can do is they can go to the competitive suppliers. And it is important, um, the, the PUC website has very nice uh, uh, frequently asked questions that goes in and helps guide customers looking at uh, making sure that they are comparing our rate that's posted and the rate of a competitive supplier. Make sure that they are um, looking at comparable terms themselves. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very important that they do look at that to select a competitive supplier if they choose. Uh, the other areas are budget billing. Um, customers can use this to help levelize, levelize their cost throughout the whole year. They'll pay for all the energy they use in the year, but it'll levelize it out over, uh, over a 12 month period. And then the last thing um, is energy efficiency. They can look at, uh, at low cost and no cost energy efficiency. Uh, opportunities that, uh, that are available today. Thank you very much. Um, okay, and finally, Mr. McCauley, did you sponsor responses to data requests in this proceeding? Uh, yes, I did. All right, and are, do you have any changes to those responses that you wish to make at this time? Uh, no, I don't. Do you adopt those responses here this uh, under oath here this afternoon? I do. Thank you. Okay, I'm now I'm going to turn to um, Mr. Crary. Good afternoon, Mr. Crary. Um, could you also restate your name for the record? Good afternoon. My name is Adam Crary. And could you state your job title and the scope of your duties with National Grid? Yes, I'm a senior pricing analyst with the New England Regulation and Pricing Department of the uh, National Grid USA Service Company, which provides regulated support to Americans and electric companies. And have you previously testified before this PUC in any other proceeding? Yes, I have. And could you uh, describe your role with respect to the company's standard offer procurement plan and the proposed rates in this proceeding? Yes, uh, my role in support of the standard offer rate filing is to calculate the rates uh, based on the final procure, uh, procurement bids uh, and forecasted kilowatt hours for the rate period, uh, as well as uh, developing uh, typical bill impacts for a variety of classes and usage levels. Um, there's been a lot of attention uh, given to the size of the rate increase at 53 percent. Can you explain this increase? Yes. Um, so there are two primary uh, sections in a customer's electric bill. Uh, as was mentioned previously, actually, um, there's the delivery section and the supply section. And the rate increase that's being discussed today is specific to the supply portion of the bill. Um, the current summer rate of 6.2 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, we're, we're proposing an increase to 9.5 cents per kilowatt hour, and that is a 53% increase 
just comparing those two rates, uh, one to one. However, uh, it's important to note, again, that this is only affecting the supply portion of the bill and does not mean that your that customers' bills will be increasing 53%. Okay, and just, just to clarify then, the 53% the is a comparison between the summer rate and the winter rate. Correct. The supply portion. That's Thank correct. you. Um, so if we were to compare the proposed rate for the supply portion of the customer's bill to the rate for the same period last year, again, on the supply portion, what is that percentage increase? Um, so comparing the uh, October 2016 supply rate of 8.2 cents to what's being proposed here, the 9 uh, it's actually a 16% increase. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd now like to turn your attention to attachment three of the company's <coughs> July 18th filing, and this has been as admitted as um, National Grid Exhibit 1, attachment three. Just let me know when you're there. Um, can you just explain for the record what that attachment uh, what that attachment shows? Sure. That's um, attachment three shows the typical bill uh, impact of the proposed standard offer rates um, for a variety of customers in the usage levels. Okay. So what is the bill increase on the total bill for a residential customer using 500 kilowatt hours if we were to compare the current rate to the proposed rate? Uh, that's 19. Um, I would also like to note that uh, there are a number of other rates that are being proposed to, to become effective October 1st. And uh, taking those into account, the total bill impact, uh, if all of those rates are, proposed, are approved as proposed, uh, that results in a total bill impact of 18.2%. Okay, thank you. And um, keeping with the total bill impact for the moment, if we were to compare last winter's rate uh, to the proposed rate here, what is that? What would that increase be on the total bill? Yes. Um, comparing uh, all rates um, effective October 1st of 2016 to all proposed rates effective October 1st of 2017 uh, results in a 14 percent increase. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Um, and lastly, did you sponsor responses to data requests in this proceeding? Yes, I did. Okay, and um, are there any changes to those responses that you wish to make at this time? No. Do you adopt those responses under oath here this afternoon? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and then one final question. Um, if we look at uh, data response PUC 1-3, Respect to those data responses that you just adopted. I'd like to specifically call your attention to attachment PUC 1 3. Okay, um, can you just walk us through what that attachment 1 3 shows? Sure. Um, so attachment one, uh, PC 1-3, one as requested, uh, shows the uh, comparison of the proposed uh, Rhode Island rates for all three customer groups um, uh, in comparison to the currently available rate information for uh, Massachusetts electric distribution companies. Um, focusing specifically on the residential section as we have been, um, the, the first rate that's shown here is the proposed Rhode Island rate for residential customers of 9.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, next, we have the Massachusetts and Nantucket Electric uh, current rate uh, through October of 2017, of, uh, just under our proposed rate in Rhode Island. It's currently at 9.4 cents. Um, and I'd, auto, I'd also pause here to um, point out that although the, the final bids are not in um, for the next period in Massachusetts, uh, based on the uh, information we currently have, the current indicators are that um, there will be an approximately 30% increase in Massachusetts uh, for Massachusetts customers for the winter rate. Um, moving on, 
we have uh, Eversource, former NSTAR. Um, their current rate through the end of the year is uh, 10.8 cents per kilowatt hours. Um, then we have Eversource, Western Massachusetts, uh, which is currently 8.7 cents through the remainder of the year. Uh, and lastly, we have Unitil, uh, which is 9.9 .9 cents through the end of November. Okay, thank you. And just um, with respect to the uh, rate for Massachusetts Electric and Nantucket Electric of 9.4 cents, is that a summer rate or a winter rate? It's currently a summer rate. <coughs> thank you. I'll now turn to <coughs> Ms. Rodormer. Good afternoon, Ms. Rodormer. Can you just restate your name for the record? Yes, I'm Laura Rodormer. And could you state your job title and scope of duties with National Grid? Yes, I'm a lead analyst for Rhode Island's um, Program for Strategy, Policy, and Evaluation. And my areas of focus are residential new construction, heating, ventilation, and the air conditioning on the electric and gas side, as well as the income eligible program. Thank you. And have you previously testified um, before this PUC and other proceedings? I have. And um, could you just, um, I think you already stated this, but uh, specifically for the uh, residential, which energy efficiency programs that you're responsible for? Sure, I'm responsible for the residential new construction, <coughs> the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning program for both the electric and gas, and the income eligible programs. Okay, thank you. Um, do you recall earlier that I posed a question to Mr. McCauley about um, what are some of the available tools to customers to mitigate impacts of increasing energy yes, costs? Okay. Um, and he responded that one of those tools is energy efficiency. I do. Could you explain the options that are available to residential customers within the company's energy efficiency program um, that can, uh, can you just explain what options are available? Sure. We have several low cost and no cost options in the energy efficiency program. Um, and the most comprehensive program is the uh, no-cost energy assessment, the home energy assessment, whereby a customer receives a um, energy specialist that goes to their home and does an evaluation of their home and determines the home's efficiency. During that time, the customer also receives um, LED lights to help the customer to reduce their electricity use, as well as power strips and shower heads. And then the customer is provided recommendations for what they can do uh, for measures such as weatherization or improving their heating or cooling systems or replacing their appliances. And in regard to weatherization, the company pays 75% of any cost, up to $4,000. So that's considered a, a low cost um, uh, program. And then the other programs for replacing the heating system or air conditioning system or appliances, we do offer incentives for, for those as well. Um, for the income eligible community, we offer the same program, but the difference is, is that, we, that all of the costs are paid for. So if a customer needs to have weatherization, that cost is paid in full. If they need a heating system replacement, that cost is paid in full, etc. So that, that is the difference between the programs. The same model exists also for the commercial sector. So for small business, medium business, and large business, the same um, assessment of uh, energy efficiency exists and the services and incentives um, apply respectively. In addition, we offer standalone programs, so um, we offer lighting discounts um, through our online portal and then we also work with different um, <coughs> excuse me, consumer organizations uh, such as um, Home Depot, Benny's, etc. where we uh, buy down the price on um, LED bulbs. And then we also offer incentives for appliances as well. Thank you. And how can customers uh, go about learning more about the company's energy efficiency offering? Absolutely. The best place to go is to go to um, www.ngrid.com slash save. And that's where they'll find most of the um, incentives for the residential programs as well as the commercial programs. Thank you very much. That's all the questions I have for this, uh, for this panel. And they are available for cross-examination. Uh, Mr. McCall, good afternoon. John Penelope. Good afternoon. Um, in your opinion, the National Grid received robust um, responses to your solicitation for standard offer service? Uh, yes, we did. Okay. And, uh, did you select the lowest bid for those solicitations? Yes, we did. Thank you. 
I have a, a follow-up question to that, just to get a little bit more specific. Um, Mr. McCauley, uh, attachment 5, page 43 of the filing, um, <coughs> contains a table uh, is in the that shows the number, or doesn't show in the, redact in the redacted version, shows the number of bids that the company received in response to the RFP. Based on your knowledge of previous RFP processes, do you consider the number of bids that you received here to be below average, average, or above average? Um, I would say about average. I have another question for Ms. Redormer. Um, are the low-cost and no-cost energy efficiency measures that you described, are they also available to renters? Um, the programs that are available to renters, they can request a home energy audit, and they, um, they will receive the light bulbs, they'll receive the power strips, as well as the shower heads. For the other measures, such as the weatherization or the replacement of appliances or heating systems or cooling systems, they would need to be um, get approval from their landlord for that. But they, they can receive services as well. One final question again for Mr. McCauley. Uh, we received a response to discovery request this morning um, on the difference between the proposed residential rate and the commercial rate. Can you just talk at a high level about some of the, the factors or feedback that you received from the suppliers on why there's a difference between that residential rate and the commercial rate? Um, so basically the, the big difference is the level of risk that the uh, wholesale suppliers will, will take on the difference between a residential and a commercial customer. The load factor, which is um, the amount of energy a customer will use based on the maximum <coughs> that they would use, with a higher uh, load factor, some of the capacity costs that I've talked about can be spread out over more uh, megawatts. Um, and the same thing can be said for uh, also from an energy pers perspective on a, uh, a risk base from the competitive supplies themselves. When you have a higher difference, uh, when you have a greater difference between the load factor, they're taking on more risk. So it mostly comes down to the risk that the wholesale suppliers are taking uh, and the fact the price difference between uh, peak and non-peak and the amount that they use are really the primary risk. I have a couple questions. Um, the first one is for um, in your professional judgment, what, what is your professional judgment regarding trends in electricity prices over you know, one, three, and five years? It, it, in one paragraph or less. <laughs> so we're, and I'll talk specifically about Rhode Island and not and not the nationally. Um, electric prices are driven by the marginal cost, and it's the cost of the next unit to come online. Um, so going forward, based on that natural gas units of the units that are actually setting, in most cases, the price itself, it's going to be dictated by the price of natural gas. Natural gas in the producing regions of West Virginia and Pennsylvania, which is where most of the generators are getting supplies, uh, there's a constraint in capacity coming from that region itself. So even though those prices are very stable, uh, the price to deliver natural gas to this area is going to be dictated by uh, weather, mostly by weather itself. So from a forecasting standpoint, if we, if we look at just the price of natural gas and in normal weather, prices are going to be pretty stable. Um, it'll really be dictated by the 
increment of generation that comes on that uh, the new gas plants that come on. Um, and the fact that we do have renewables coming on, that will actually help with some of the peaks itself. So going forward, we should see somewhat stable prices until we have weather conditions that will, that will drive the prices uh, either higher or lower when you have norm, when you have let out warmer than normal and uh, lower than normal in the wintertime and, 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 and cooler uh, in the summertime, you get less price spikes to, to, to the cost of energy itself. So going forward, based on just gas prices, they'll be fairly stable when you look at the price, but weather will, will have a bigger drop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Ms. Redormer. Uh, can you describe your progress in delivering energy efficiency services to the income eligible population and the kinds of outreach that you've conducted in, in uh, working with these folks, some of whom we heard from this morning, to help them um, address their energy challenges? Absolutely. So through our income eligible services program, we work directly with the community action programs, the CAPS, of which we work with um, the six CAPS within Rhode Island. And we meet regularly with them. We have a, um, a program delivery model where we have a, um, a lead vendor who works hand in hand with all of the CAPS to help them to understand what all of the, uh, the intricacies of the, uh, the energy efficiency program. And then we conduct um, outreach throughout the year. Uh, so we, um, we do marketing outreach through the CAPS as well as we do it on the commercial level at the statewide level. And we also um, work with our customer service team at the expos in order to provide energy efficiency information uh, during the time that customers come looking for rate information as well, rate and arrears and, and payment plans. Um, and so we are more thoroughly engaged with the community action programs um, in order to make sure that we're providing um, as much assistance as possible to educate people about their energy use and then help them to reduce their energy consumption. And again, through the no-cost energy services um, of the home energy assessment and then replacement of weather, or the addition of weatherization or replacement of services if warranted. So it's all, I, I know you, have, you set goals every year about how many households to reach. Have you been able to meet those goals? We have. We've been able, um, we've succeeded in reaching the goals in terms of the number of customers as well as exceeding the savings, um, helping the customers to reach their savings goals. And moving forward into the, um, into the future, we are trying to increase our goals and that will be covered under the Energy Efficiency Program Plan um, uh, uh, docket that we'll be having. In the future. And, and have you worked with the George Wiley Center to help share some of the, the success stories of people who have been struggling with their bills and then have been able to use some of the tools that you've offered? Is that a dialogue that's ongoing? National Grid has worked with the George Wiley Center. I personally have not. I just want to follow up with Commissioner Gold's questions, uh, Ms. Redormer. Are you undertaking any activities to increase the awareness access or marketing of the energy efficiency programs in light of um, this proposal? In light of this proposal? Is the one we're currently delivering yes. today. Um, so one of the things that we're working on is um, is obviously increasing our marketing and, and working with our community action programs. We meet quarterly with the CAPS to dem um, discuss best practices as well as any trends that are currently facing us uh, within the within the state in energy efficiency. Um, and we also, uh, I think that in, in terms of this, it's, it's certainly something that we want to, I think, probably re reach broader into the community and um, provide more education. One of the things that we do also is we provide the home energy report, um, which goes out to tens of, uh, hundreds of thousands of customers within Rhode Island, and we're utilizing that tool to promote the Income Eligible Services Program, as well as information about the Arrears Program and Budget Program. So it's an energy efficiency tool that's trying to cross-promote. Excuse me, Commissioner. I, I need to clarify my response before. When you asked me the question about energy, I was specifically talking about energy and not the supplier cost to include capacity. So if you were you referring to just the energy component or the whole supplier cost? I was actually referring to energy. 
energy component, but if you have some additional information to share, that would be terrific. Sure. I mean, as what we were talking about here today, as far as the increase in our supplier costs, it is mostly due to the capacity component that we were talking about. Uh, and we do know, and it is in one of our data responses, we showed what the forward capacity auction results were for the last, and that component will be going up for the next uh, uh, two years. They do start to come off in the, in, in the third year, but still it won't be as low as the costs uh, that we've seen in those first seven years. So from a standpoint of billions of dollars, the first seven years was about a billion dollars. Um, I have to go, but it's, uh, I'm trying to refresh my memory. I'm, uh, it was, it was, a yes, it was a billion dollars in those first seven years. It's now increasing, it'll peak next year at, um, I think it's $14 billion. I'll have to check that. And in a couple of years out, it'll levelize at around $3 billion. And that's the cost of the capacity itself and that forward capacity auction itself. I, I would like to check those, those numbers. Thank you. That sounds like we will anticipate these higher costs to be in effect for several years. For the next couple of years, we will, total supply costs will be going up. Again, I apologize. I, what you were asking about just the energy component itself. But yes, for the next couple of years, they will be going up. They will be coming down a little, just again, based on the forward capacity. Doesn't include doesn't include the energy component. Um, but those, even a couple of years out, will be higher than what we've seen over, over the first several years. So I apologize for that. And are those increases also all um, a result of the same um, changes that you spoke about earlier? Yes, about the uh, adequacy of, of generation resources that the ISO, so the ISO goes out, does the, the, the auction three years in advance, and new generation that will come on, or existing generation, will bid in what they feel is they need to, how much money they need to receive in order to continue to operate, and or a new generation facility to come on. So the auction itself, provides the opportunity for the lowest cost even new generation when needed to come in at the at the at their cost of that. Does the fact that you anticipate um, the capacity prices going down if not as much as they were the first seven auction years um, a result of new generation capacity having gone in I, I without looking at what the data was forward, how much was new, how much was existing, how much is going to be retired, what's going to be replaced, what's what's the load changing. So so there are many factors. I haven't looked out the the actual what's causing in those uh, years beyond uh, the next three years. Mr. McCauley, can you just clarify when FCA 7 and FCA, well no, FCA 8 and FCA 9 occurred? So they occurred three years prior, so FCA 8 occurred in February of 2014 for the period June 2017 through May 2018. That, the auction occurs in February, I think the award occurs in March, not sure. Uh, the numbers that I was giving you was the billions of dollars. I'm, I'm not sure about those, but what I, what I can give you is what the new resources, this is PUC 1-1, page 2. Uh, and this gives you an indication of the new resources and existing resources. So for the FCA 7, it was $3.15 per kilowatt hour a month, increasing to 15 as part of FCA 8. And then for FCA 9, it's 17.7. .7. Now again, this is just the new resources. It's a blend of both the new resource and the existing source to get to what actually the capacity costs are that will be spread amongst all load. 
Mr. Kobe, do you have any further? Mr. Rackham. Thank you, Jim. And uh, I'm not going to address my questions to any one particular person. I'll just uh, throw them out there and whoever would like to jump in and answer, feel free. Um, there's been uh, testimony that the current prices listed on the uh, DPUC website in Power, Rhode Island, do have competitive suppliers. In fact, I checked this morning and I saw three of them offering significantly less uh, power at significantly less price than what is being proposed in this docket. In fact, uh, the average of three of them is about 6.2 cents uh, for residential versus the 9.5 uh, being offered here. Um, now I heard the explanation uh, regarding um, how the, the slightly different periods of time involved but do you think, um, and feel free to jump in, do you think that the PUC should at least take a look at the difference in the procurement practices between National Grid under its currently approved plan and what the competitive suppliers are doing that are able to have the competitive suppliers offer a rate that's 6.2 cents right now versus the proposed rate of 9.5? Yeah. I, I think I... I know it said we we are a regulated utility and we need to file our plan and that needs to be done on uh, on, on an annual basis. The competitive suppliers are, are not regulated, so they they do have the flexibility to vary what you know what and how they offer uh, pricing uh, to customers itself. So um, in order for us to have a process that we would approve a plan. Um, that would uh, have the same flexibility that competitive suppliers would would, would probably be very uh, would be very difficult. Um, competitive suppliers do they you know we don't earn anything on on the energy itself or the or supply services itself. Competitive suppliers do, um, and they're able to uh, look to. A lot of times, in more the larger commercial industrial customers, and be able to customize something that might fit them fit them better itself. So, we we're, we're certainly open to looking, continuing to look at our plan to improve it. But it's a, a process that we need to go through to file uh, and get approved by the PUC itself. Would you think that increasing National Grid's flexibility with regard to the existing procurement plan? Uh, would be something that the Commission should consider? When, um, what do you mean by flexibility? Well, you were just talking about flexibility and how competitive suppliers have that kind of flexibility. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're able to offer a lower rate. And I was following up on that and suggesting that um, maybe National Grid in conjunction with the Commission in reviewing the procurement plan on a regular basis should uh, think about proposing something that gives grid more flexibility. Let me just uh, give you an example. Let's assume, that, let me back up, you're buying in certain approved blocks now, correct? Correct. Right. For certain approved periods of time, correct? Correct. You don't have the flexibility to deviate from that without coming back to the PUC and asking for a change in the procurement plan, correct? Correct. However, you could ask the PUC to provide you with some flexibility over and above those defined periods of time, um, either a window of, say for example, you, uh, you see that the market is at a really good place right now, and it might be a good idea to lock in a rate for nine months instead of six months or three months, depending on the customer. Would you like to have that kind of flexibility to try to lock in uh, what would be a good rate at that particular period of time? Um, and that's why I asked the question flexibility. I was talking about flexibility of different months, different periods to be able to offer. What you're talking about is flexibility of actually, as you said, when we um, uh, enter into these uh, FRS contracts with wholesale suppliers. Um, and I would say, 
No, the answer to that question is I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily want that flexibility. As I said, we need to, um, to have that flexibility, you're really making a market call on the process, and that then becomes very dependent on the individual that's making that decision. What National Grid's plan is, um, is a plan that can be executed by people that A, understand what, what they're doing, but it's a, it's, a, it's a repeatable plan that we're doing for our customers, and it becomes more of process-driven, uh, setting for a good process, as opposed to being reliant on a specific individual to make market calls. Because really, at each and any moment, when we go out, we are getting the best prices from the wholesale suppliers at that moment in time. And all fundamental factors are built into that price whether it's what the expectations are for generation, what's the price of gas, what's the price of renewables, the impact that that, that will have. And at any moment in time, there's a 50-50 chance that prices could go up from that point or down from that point. And if it wasn't, if there were fundamental factors such that there was a difference, there would be an arbitrage that would be very quickly the price difference between what the fundamentals of where energy should be and where the actual market is changing, and very quickly, that spread collapses itself. So the fact that having this flexibility to do different timing, um, I think strays from what we should be doing is by continuing to do what we're doing, locking up prices over this period of time, which helps um, levelize this price that we're paying to the customers and it, loose, it reduces the volatility from between period on period itself. So you don't think the Commission should take a look at whether or not giving you some additional flexibility might be of a benefit to the rate payers? Not from a standpoint of, of timing, uh, no. Well, from any standpoint? Well, I, I, I think we would be open to flexibility of, of uh, changing the procurement plan. Well, could you explain what you mean by that? Well, we, um, I believe it was last year the, the company proposed uh, a modification to the plan itself. And uh, the Commission rejected those modifications, correct? Correct. Have you taken a look at whether if the Commission had approved those modifications, the rate that you're proposing here today would be less, more, or the same? We, we didn't do that analysis, but I, I mean, I can give you my opinion of where I think it might be. We didn't do the analysis because it would be very hard to replicate what we have done uh, at the time. Um, but our current plan, as I said, has us locking in six-month terms, 12-month terms, 18-month terms, and 24-month terms. And the uh, proposal was to go to just 12 and, and 18 months. The other uh, piece was to um, lock up a fixed price over, a, over that whole term itself. And in essence, what that would do is I'd be taking the higher price winter months and shifting some of that cost into the summertime. So with that said, what probably would have happened is our summer rates would be higher and the winter rates would be a little bit lower. But overall, the energy cost for that whole period, the market doesn't change, the prices don't change in a month. You're just shifting costs from a winter month to a summer month. Um, so we'd have a little bit higher summer uh, and a little bit lower winter, but the total energy cost would be the same. Uh, would you agree that there is some benefit to levelizing the overall cost for a year, for example, so that you don't have the spike that so many people have complained about here today, and you spread it out so the impact is less? Um, to, to levelize that, the, the, the customers can do that through the budget billing effectively. That's what budget billing does, is it spreads that, that same cost across. Again, it's, you're not changing the, the absolute you're not changing the absolute cost over that period. It's the same pricing, you're just shifting that, and, and customers can do that through budget bill. Oh, I, I understand that, but also what customers see is a 53% increase in the standard offer charge. Uh, if we adopt the kind of flexibility that you proposed in the last plan, it's unlikely it would be as high as 53% as we sit here, correct? Correct, but it would be the same cost. Oh, I, I follow you. It would be the same cost over the years, over the entire year. But it wouldn't be 53%, and people would be less rate-shocked. Would you agree? I mean, you proposed it because you thought it was a good idea, right? It, it, would, it would increase the rate shock, yes. Decrease the rate shock. De yeah. <laughs> what we're currently doing increases the rate shock. Okay.
have any plans to ask the commission again to consider your uh, procurement plan uh, revisions? Not at this time. Do you have any other proposed revisions? Well, let me ask uh, a foundation question. I would assume that you're always looking at the potential of revising your procurement plan to get the best deal for the ratepayers. Is that a fair statement? We're always looking to improve the plan. <laughs> and so, uh, if you if you have an idea that you think might uh, improve the plan, uh, you won't be shy about coming to the commission and suggesting. It, correct. Uh, correct. Yes, we'd first probably uh, sit with uh, with other parties, whether it's other utilities, with the division, with the OER. But yes, with the lieutenant governor. Maybe. Sure, he so chooses. Do you have any um, suggestions that are uh, on your drawing board right now that you're considering? Uh, not at this, not at this uh, moment. I, I mean, I think, I mean, and the reason is we just went through a year and a half ago, and I think it's important, um, and I, I think it's important to play out, you know, what the difference in the rates between the summer and the winter rates. <coughs> Uh, what it will do uh, and the impact so we should, I don't think we should just go based on one year and I understand that but we also uh, came up with a 53% increase in the standard offer charge which is creating a lot of pain so uh, I would hope you continue to look at it and we'll come to the Commission with any suggestions you might have uh, we will Now, one of the discussions that you had with Commissioner Gold uh, is where rates are going in the future. And, and the, I want to make sure I understand this, and I'm not overstating it, but as I understand your data response uh, and your response to the questions from Commissioner Gold, given the fact that the forward capacity auction takes place three years in advance, you've already got a pretty good handle on what's going to be happening when we're sitting here next year at this time and the year after that at this time, correct? Um. We do based uh, for the capacity itself, yes. And capacity is a big driver of this, correct? Capacity has been a big driver of the price increase, yes. So I, if, as I read your data response 1-4 uh, to the commission, um, if I, have I read it correctly that when we're sitting here at this time next year, the, the price which you're now proposing at 9.5 cents is going to be about 2 cents higher than even that? Did I read that properly? Uh, yes, you did. That, that doesn't have all the um, components of the FRS contracts that we've done, uh, but it, it does have some of those, and it has the, the forecasted uh, capacity cost of it, yes. And the following year, will it go up even more based on the FCAs? Uh, give me a minute, please. Yes, they will. Any idea how much? Is it, would it be another two cents, one cent? How much more? Estimate. It's difficult for me to estimate because I don't, when I, when I look at PUC 1-1, one -one, um, I don't know right now what percent of the new resources and the old resources will make up that capacity cost. But you know it's going up. Yes. No, I think the other thing you testified in response to Commissioner Gold's questioning is that it, it appears that we've peaked and that the numbers will eventually be coming down even though we're on a three-year lag. Is that correct? We've peaked, as, as, as PUC 1-1 shows, the peak will occur in the future, in, right. the next, in the next two to three years. And after two to three years, it is showing that uh, capacity prices will come down. And again, when it's capacity prices, energy, uh, right now we don't know where energy is going. <coughs> I understand that, but focusing on capacity yeah, prices, sure. and I understand that you're talking about in the future because the capacity auction is three years into the future, but the capacity auctions have already occurred. We know those prices already, and so the prices in the capacity auctions that I believe you disclosed in the data responses are coming down, correct? Uh, yes, after, in, in the future, after the, uh, after FCA 9, I believe FC, right. FCA 10 is down. All right, so let, let's see, was it FCA 8 that was the really high one at $17 for new construction? No, that's FCA 9. 9, okay. So that'll be next um, June 18 through May 19. All right, so 9 was $17, and then was 10, 15 or something like that? 
what was ten? Eight. 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 FCA eight for new resources was fifteen dollars. Okay. FCA nine. FCA nine for new resources is seventeen point seven. All right. I don't 10. have in front of me ten. But you know it. You know it went down below seventeen. Correct. Yes. Significantly below seventeen. Correct. I, I I can't say that. I don't know the number. And uh, FCA eleven has already occurred. Correct. Just this past February? Uh, yes, yes. And that number went down again? Uh, yes. So eventually, we're going to get the, uh, the benefit of those reductions, but we've got to get through the three-year lag, correct? Correct. Do you know if National Grid would have any objection to um, putting a reference on its bills uh, so that its customers could take a look at the competitive suppliers and the offerings that they have on Empower Rhode Island? I don't believe that I can answer that question. Who could answer that? I don't believe any, we have a witness here today that can speak to the billing. Um, can I ask that as a tater request? We can, we can, we can take it back. You want to make a record request? Yes, please. Could you state it, please? Uh, would National Grid have any objection to referencing on its bill the Empower RI website so that customers could compare the rates of competitive suppliers? Chairperson, I would like to just note, though, for the record, I believe that um, a couple of years ago we did, there were some changes done on the website that enabled um, publication of what our rate is relative to the competitive suppliers so that customers could make that you know, apples to apples comparison of the rate. Um, I, I think that was one enhancement that was done a couple of years ago. Um, we can certainly inquire about the bill. I know that, um, you know, sometimes this availability of white space on the bill is tricky. Making changes to that is tricky. Yes, I thought. You're referring to the National Grid website? No, I was referring to the National Grid bill. No, I was asking. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was available through either the Commission or Division website for the competitive yeah, suppliers. There, that, and yeah. he was referring to that, the Empower website, yes. which is. Um, to, to the panel again and throwing it out there to see if there's anybody who may have knowledge about this. Is there anyone uh, there who can answer a question about the LIHEAP uh, eligibility and funding? Nobody. I'm sorry, I don't. Um, could you just state your question? Yeah, the question that I have is uh, do you know whether when um, if a uh, customer of National Grid elects to go with a competitive supplier instead of National Grid, that affects in any way their eligibility for LIHEAP help. I don't believe that's the case. No. Okay. Um, is there, are you sure of that, or do you just not believe it? Yes, I'm sure. All right. Thank you very much. Can I have one moment? That's all I have. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, I just may have one short person. Um, you had explained earlier, Mr. McCauley, that energy is typically a little bit more expensive in the winter than in the summer, correct? Yes. Okay. And the, the current pricing periods that uh, are in effect are winter pricing period and the summer pricing period, as you indicated. As compared to a 12 month pricing period, say January through December pricing period, which construct, 12 month pricing period or a pricing period with a winter block and a summer block, two pricing periods, more accurately reflect the underlying contract prices on a monthly basis that the customers are selling? Um, the, 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 the six month 
uh, periods will provide a price difference, and that is uh, what the prices are in the market for energy at those points. So if there is a desire to let customers know, uh, give customers a better signal, price so signal, of what they're actually hey, paying yeah. for, what the actual underlying cost for their energy consumed is, uh, is it the 12-month <coughs> contract or the 2 6 months? The two six month contracts would then reflect. Thank you. Uh, and then there was a little bit of discussion earlier about budget billing. Um, and even absent a change in rates, customers' bills can fluctuate on a monthly basis through consumption change. Right? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And let's say for an electric heating customer, those monthly fluctuations could be fairly dramatic, especially in the winter months, correct? Yes. So what, very briefly, describe what is budget billing and how customers can take advantage of it. I will I'll do my best. It's certainly not my 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 area. Um, but I what I believe happens is the company will estimate <coughs> what the use will be in each particular month. Uh, calculate and then use that weighted uh, load use by the energy price and will come up uh, with an average price for the 12 months. So that customer, instead of paying a very large bill in the winter, small bill in the summer, will pay the same amount every month. Correct. And Not avoid any energy costs, but levelize the energy. Right. That's correct. Uh, Chairperson, excuse me, um, Mr. Arnold, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I did just want to point out that in um, docket 4393, uh, the company did submit responses to data, uh, data requests, um, which described uh, Commission 3-4, um, describes the budget billing program, um, the bill payment program. Um, it does give an explanation um, of how we do base the budget payment. Um, so that's Commission 3-4 and Docket 4393. Um, and we also, in response to uh, data requests in that same docket, um, Commission 6-1, um, we did explain uh, the steps that the company has taken and, and does take to promote budget billing. So if um, the Commission would like to take administrative notice of those data requests because we do not have a specific witness here today on the budget billing program. Just to... Are there any objections to that? No objection. No objection. We'll take administrative notice of that. Did you get them, Councilor? I think so. That would be docket 4393, uh, PUC 3-4, and PUC 6-1, National Grid's responses. Correct? That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Well, there was, uh, <clears throat> based on my understanding, uh, in the approval of the, the last standard offer uh, procurement plan that was proposed, there was quite a bit of discussion around uh, price signals and sending proper price signals uh, as to when the energy is <coughs> more expensive to procure uh, and passing along those signals uh, via the marketplace and via rates. So there's a potential benefit um, if uh, users know what the price is of the product they're using, you're saying? Depends on the perspective. Are there any uh, cost allocation drawbacks with levelizing high winter prices into the summer? 
Uh, yes, I would say there are. You're, you're deferring costs um, through, um, say, for example, a calendar year period. There, there was a, a transitional rate of, uh, I believe, nine months in 2015. Um, and uh, also at that point, um, the Commission had also uh, directed us to defer 10% of the costs in the winter rates for commercial classes as well into the, the second half of the year. So uh, there is some cost shifting and allocation that, that does occur. Um, however, as it has been mentioned, this is a, a cost recovery tariff, uh, and we do return any over uh, recovery back to customers. <coughs> So if you overcollect, that money goes back to the ratepayers. That's correct. When do you true that up? Uh, it's annually. It's a calendar year uh, reconciliation. And it's uh, your standard offer. It's included in our annual retail rate filing in uh, February. Related to that, um, I would ask you and Mr. McCauley about um, some of the flexibility that National Grid um, might have in procurement. The flexibility that uh, a non-regulated power producer has, um, should that not pan out for them? Should they offer their customers a six cent rate and actually end up with an eight cent cost? Who bears the risk of, of paying for that two cents they now need to make up? That would be the non-regulated power producer. And, and if they over-collect, if it's the other way around and they over-collect, um, it's profit. Your attorney earlier today uh, read a section of the um, Title 39. Uh, she referred to this being a national grid. Uh, this is from 39-1-27.3, paragraph B, uh, that the rates that are charged by the electric distribution company to customers for standard offer service shall be approved by the commission and shall be designed to recover the electric distribution company's cost and no more than the electric distribution company distribution company's cost, provided that the commission may establish and or implement a rate that averages the cost over periods of time. So just to that first part, um, if National Grid, you had said, over collects, uh, you return that money to your rate payers. If National Grid used flexibility and, and under collected, um, what is your interpretation and what do you expect National Grid would do? Well, through the tariff, we are allowed full cost recovery, so we would recover that under recovery through the next rate period. Mr. McCauley, National Grid uh, submits a, a procurement plan in the spring uh, of every year, uh, for the last few years, maybe five years now. Um, when do you actually begin procuring? When does the first procurement period happen? Uh, under the current approved procurement plan? Um, well, it, it depends upon the, the season itself. So it's we would start 21 months before the rate period in the winter time. So since the winter period is, is six months itself, so it could be as much as 27 months, 27 months prior to the month of use. But working from the procurement plan itself, you would file a procurement plan in the spring of a given year? How soon after that plan is filed would you actually go out and execute? Is it months, a year? So in 2016, mm -hmm. this docket 4605 got a procurement plan approved. When was the first procurement in that procurement plan for residential GM? Um, I just want to make sure I get So the procurement plan 16 are for procurements that we're doing in the year of 2016, and again, depending upon the period, um, it would be, uh, we, we'd look at our schedule and it would be for a winter period, it would be 21 months before, so whenever 21 months was before that first winter period, we would start procuring. But you certainly procure after it's been approved. Yes. So I was just wondering how long after it's been approved. Uh, but I think we can move forward and take that as a day or a Sure. What do you imagine, since since you work in the wholesale market, 
um, might be the effect to competitive suppliers if um, on a proposal by proposal basis and block by block basis, national grid um, moved around its procurement and its pricing plan for 50% of the load. Um, would that make it easier or harder for competitive suppliers to compete uh, with your and give their customers a rate to compare? Uh, yes, if we if we have a larger block done at a particular price, and then depending upon the time between when that was locked up and when the effective rate was, the competitive supplier, if prices went down, they'd be able to offer a lower rate than ours. Uh, if prices went up, their price would be uh, would be higher if they hadn't hedged themselves. And you do you serve about um, fifty percent of the load now? I. For the residential total load, total, total, total load. I'll, I'll have to. I, I think I know by by, by uh, customer group. I'm go ahead. Sure. Go ahead by customer group. I, I believe it's fifty percent for. Um, actually, I, I don't. I don't want to give numbers because I'll have to take that as a record request, please. Um. So for the load that you you may serve, um, your rates are known, or you've proposed your rates 75 days in advance of the rate actually occurring. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Yes, that's correct. I, I do have the, the numbers for the percentage. I, I forgot to have it here on um, attachment rate one, um, page three of five. Uh, Eighty-seven percent is the number for the residential customers. Uh, Fifty percent is for the uh, commercial customers. <clears throat> Serving such a large portion of the load, do you think it would be would have a significant effect to significantly alter your procurements? Uh, with the type of flexibility that a competitive supplier might be able to exercise? I'm, I'm sorry. So given the size of the load that you're trying to procure for, um, do you think it would have a, a, a legitimate supply and demand effect to um, move around the procurements at National Grid's um, discretion the way that a competitive supplier might move around? So if you suddenly if you indicated to the market that National Grid was intending to, pursuant to an approved procurement plan, go out and bid for 20% of its 87% uh, of residential load, and then changed your mind, do you think that that would have that that sudden drop in demand may have an effect on the market? Sure. Whenever you have a large percentage of uh of a demand out there for something depending upon you know how large it is in the wholesale suppliers themselves uh, some might not be willing to uh, or not wanting to take that much risk in a particular rate class so yes the larger uh, uh, blocks of percentage that you go out there um, will uh, will have a greater risk on the wholesale supplier and it actually might add a risk premium um, to that itself uh, if you have a greater percentage itself um, then there's probably a greater migration risk uh, that you might have that the wholesale supplier would have to factor into his price also. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? No, I do not, Chairperson. Are there any further questions for this? No further questions from the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. And thank you very much.